All right, all right. Hey, everybody, it's Dave Cooper, and we are in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And guess who's with us? Good old Mark Barenaked Willie with his Elmer Fudd hat on. I love it, Mark. It must be cold where you're at. Oh, my God. Welcome, Harris Woodward. Welcome. <laughs> you know this guy, right? We are at the Modular Home Builders Association annual meeting, meeting in Harrisburg. Mark, I got in here like at 10 o'clock last night. I was in Texas all week where it was 90 degrees. I uh, I tuned in every day this week. You were all over the place. Uh, I you know much respect to your family for letting you you know uh, jet plane flying, Rolex wearing, suit wearing, travels. Love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt we were. So hey, did you catch some of the places we were at? Oh, you know what? I don't know. I saw I saw a nice tea stud ad with. Uh, with our good buddy, Matt Reisinger, while we were out there. We got to go to Matt Reisinger's house. We had him on the show. Icon 3D printing. We didn't go live there, but wait until people see some of the stuff that we were doing. And a net zero home capable community built on all geothermal. 2,000 acres, Mark. I love the geothermal. Not only did I catch you live, but in the evenings, people that were with you at events were calling me, telling me what happened behind the scenes, Dave. Oh, well, you know what, Mark, you know, those things, we can talk about them behind the scenes. How about that? We don't, <laughs> those, those, those drunken, those drunken scooter rides, we don't want to bring up right now. They, they were great stories. Everyone's based on innovation and collaboration this week. And it's wonderful to have you and Harris at, at Modular. Nice to have you back. You got it, Mark. Nice to be back. I won't be here for the whole shindig, but uh, I'll put in my two cents. We do have a conference going on. Yeah, you know, well, he sits, he sits, he sits on the uh, board here for the MHBA, uh, so he's kind of a big wig when it comes to that. But you know, we're also going to have another guest join us briefly uh, in a moment here, and uh, I think her name is Nikki something. You know, the girl, you know her, Nikki. She's a she's a real, I guess, expert in this dehumidification stuff. Uh, apparently. Miss Moisture Control is so popular that over 100 people signed up before today's event. So much respect to Nikki and all the all of our friends interested in moisture control. That's it. So, all right, before we do that, though, if you're just joining us, we are live on three locations, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. Please hit that like and subscribe button right now. And if you're not following us on YouTube, please go to YouTube and follow us and subscribe there as well. All right, Mark, I think it is time. We should not keep such an important person waiting any longer. Let's bring in Nikki. Hey, what's happening, Nikki? Hello. How are you? Great to see you guys. Yeah, it's great to see you. Mark, look, Mark's ready to go already. Go for it, man. <laughs> I, I, I'm ready. I know you were on a couple planes to uh, to get settled in this Friday, just like Dave and Nikki. So we're thrilled to have you. We're thrilled for this topic. It's always relevant to talk about relative humidity. It is. And it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh Mark, you you might have met your match today. Here we go. <laughs> I, I I I she is, not only is she a building scientist, but she is a wordsmith, and okay. it's it's so interesting the different parts of of the country that each of you were at this week, Wisconsin and Texas, uh, and now being back where you are, it's important to note that our climate affects our buildings. And whether our buildings are stick built or built in a factory, like a modular building, those all have an effect on our buildings. And that's why we're gravitating together for this uh, innovative collaboration. Absolutely. Yep, sure. I, I don't think it matters uh, what type of building or house you have or where you're located. Indoor air quality is part of it. As soon as you put people in the house, we got to think about indoor air quality. Yeah. Not just our houses, all of our buildings, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Every building. All right. But hey, Nikki, you know, before we get into this, okay, we, there's one thing we need to know, and we need to know everything from the moment you were born to this very second in life, all within a matter of three to five minutes. Give us your elevator pitch. We want to hear all about your background so everybody knows who you are and where you come from and why you're on this show. Uh, sure. So basically, I have a BA and BS. Um, my background is communications <laughs> um, and public relations. 
And uh, I've been very fortunate to to work with companies that have been in the indoor air quality industry for almost 20 years now. So came uh, started with really uh, air cleaners, humidifiers, zoning, uh, the whole gamut of, of indoor air quality products. And then uh, that led me to Thermostore where we really focus on dehumidification. So Thermostore manufactures uh, restoration dehumidifiers, industrial dehumidifiers, and then residential as well. So a big part of that is the ventilation, the filtration, and the humidity control. So uh, yeah, I, I was in public relations for Thermostore and became very passionate, which led me down the rabbit hole of of building science. And uh, now I truly feel like I'm one of the cool kids. Well, you are a cool <laughs> kid. Listen, anytime you get to hang out with somebody like Mark Willie, you know, Mark, I, I was just thinking offline. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Harris kind of follow up on everything that that Nikki just said, but you might have to take the hat off to let that blood circulate. I think we're in for a, a good conversation. I, 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 I'm in the, I'm in the back warehouse right now, and uh, yeah, I'm just trying to stay warm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if I may, Dave, you may. Time, um, I'm going to go back into the modular home builder association meeting, but I had to put it out there. Nikki, how is COVID affecting what you're doing? Uh, that's probably a rhetorical question. And I, I. I think that people have a greater awareness of indoor air quality. And so the healthier we can keep our buildings and keep our homes, the better chance we have of staying healthy, no matter what we're exposed to. So we, we are full capacity in our factory right now. And um, not just COVID, but of course, we manufacture restoration equipment. So we've got the hurricanes happening. Um, so that that definitely increases uh, our factory capacity as well. But we uh, apply dehumidification and ventilation in schools, churches, all of our buildings. And so right now we are busy and indoor air quality is top of awareness for most people. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, it affects everybody, no matter how you build. So yeah. it, it really does. And Nikki, we didn't really introduce Harris to you. If you don't know Harris, he's he's part of the whole Ken Semler group. You know, we have this little uh, buddy system here in the modular. We've just been in it together for 20 plus years. But Harris uh, has finished works out of Maryland and he is a net zero. We have, Harris, we yeah. have met. Yeah, we did. It was about two and a half years ago. Yes. Yes. We were yeah. working on that, that uh, one particular project. Yep, yep, I remember now. Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah, yep. I know that one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Harris, you're gonna. I know Harris is gonna jump back in there, but yeah, you know, Harris, sure. Harris is a leader in in modular when it comes to uh, building green, energy efficient, net zero homes. So I wanted them to come in and the say the hi. The more you talk me up, the harder I have to work. Thank you. <laughs> go, go, go! Teach them something, would you? I'll try. Yeah. Nikki, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see really. you. Yeah, likewise. And Mark. Get some blood up there, will you, pal? All right. All good, brother. All good. Thumbs up. Peace. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. On with the show, as they would say. All right, Mark. Why don't why don't why don't we kick this off, uh, Nikki? I think that you know one of the one of the things that that has come up over and over again on this show is moisture in water is bad for homes, right? Um, why don't Why don't you lead into you know? kind of what you're focused on right now and why dehumidification and just, just in an envelope, uh, an envelope is not the right word because we talk about building it. Perfect envelopes. word. It's a perfect word, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Give us the overview of why, and then let's dive into some of the bullet points that we talked about. So give us the overview of why this is so important. Sure. So our construction practices are changing very rapidly um, in the last several years where we again, are focusing, focusing on being very energy efficient. So we're tightening up that envelope as much as possible. Um, we want to be able to control our environment without using a lot of, of energy. And so by doing so, we need to add ventilation to our homes. Um, we are sizing our HVAC equipment based on uh, best practices, which is manual J, which oftentimes it automatically oversizes our equipment. And really our heating and cooling equipment is designed to get to a temperature. 
And as a byproduct of that, it will remove moisture for the air conditioning. Um, but the goal is not to use our heating and cooling equipment as much as possible to really tighten up that house and be energy efficient. But the challenge is people generate moisture. We have a lot of climate zones in the United States where we have a lot of moisture a lot of the time, and we've got to bring that in for ventilation. How are we going to deal with that moisture? Plus, we've got spaces below our house, basements crawl spaces that don't need cooling necessarily, but they need moisture control. Right. So we, we, from a from a liability standpoint for a builder to property protection, to comfort, to health, moisture is, is just a huge component of it. And it's always been a byproduct of air conditioning. Right, right. right. It's, it's really well said. So it's not just what's done once the once the people are in the house. It's on many of these levels. It's dealing with the, the, the concrete, the wood, the plaster, the paint, the thin sets, all of these heavy, heavy, uh, rich filled moisture carriers that we introduce to the building before occupy, uh, they're occupied. And so a lot of times you need equipment and you need to take measures before the equipment that stays with the house is even turned on to take care of the environment uh, for the environment and for the workers of that, of that space. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So let's talk about that. You know, so one of the topics is dialing in a new vision for moisture control. But let's let's break that down. What does really does it mean to dial in a new vision for moisture control? Because not all is moisture all bad for a house. Do you have to have some moisture in a house? I think there's a there's a balance that we have to look at. Is there not? Absolutely. I mean, too little can be bad as as well, if, especially when it comes to the wood in our homes. Um, you know, that'll start splitting and cracking and also depends on what else we have in our homes. If we have artwork, if we have uh, musical instruments and even our health. So we need a certain level of moisture in our homes, but when it gets over to what, you know, we, we say tipping point, but it's really the dripping point, right? When we get over a certain threshold that our buildings can't handle it anymore, then that's when we're going to start seeing issues. And, and, you know, there's two components to that. There's relative humidity, and then there's also dew point. And relative humidity is relative to the temperature. So uh, we can't just say keep it below 60%. What we need to know is the temperature in what at 60%, so we understand truly how much moisture is in the air. And it's, that gets you know, that's when we start using psychrometric charts and stuff like that, which is diving much deeper. But relative humidity is relative temperature. Dew points when we're going to get condensation. And as an industry, we need to start talking more about dew points and how our buildings work and the flow of air in and out, because we need to understand where our condensation points are going to be. And then from a relative humidity standpoint, as soon as the humid season hits, and if you're in a humid climate, we need to understand that our our buildings and our materials and everything in our buildings are going to be constantly absorbing moisture. Yeah. So it's going to absorb and absorb to get to the point where it can't absorb anymore. And then we're going to see potential microbial growth and that sort of thing. Um, so you wet and dry and wet and dry, you're okay. But if you're just wetting, 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 which right. we're seeing more in high performance home, because we're not leaky anymore. We're not wetting and drying, wetting and drying. We're just wetting, 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 and we need something to deal with that. And, and, and the points leading up to that, you mentioned the dew point and the condensation. A lot of times by the time we see it, feel it, experience it, the damage is already done and, and those scary aspects that people are afraid to talk about are happening in our cavities, in our joy space, and in oftentimes areas where air is being pulled from, from a unit that probably shouldn't have been used in that house to begin with. Yeah. It's, it's been very interesting moving to the Mid-Atlantic from Wisconsin because the the 
the ventilation strategies need to be very specific to what your climate zone is. Um, I work with a lot of builders in the South and in the Mid-Atlantic where they use exhaust only ventilation yep. because it's the cheapest option. And one CFM out means one CFM in and you're not controlling where it's coming from. You're not filtering it. You're not conditioning it. Um, and the tighter we get, I had one uh, project in Maryland at townhouse where they were exhausting continuous on the third level bathroom and it was pulling in air for makeup air on the first level bathroom Yep. where there was a supply and it was condensing and basically raining in that bathroom. Yep. So it right, means right. we need to think about our ventilation strategies um, for our typical, for our climate zone. And then also think about, you know, where's the condensation point in those walls if we're pulling in through those walls. It, Nikki, that's so well said. So, so sometimes people don't realize the way the house is designed and the materials that are specified, they, 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 they actually get a tight house by accident, right? They, 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 they're having these wonderful materials at their disposal. The house happens to be tight, but the old practice of, of exhausting only is that exact scenario. So if, if you are on a project that is exhaust only, that part of the conversation she just had was specifically for you. There needs to be greater co uh, collaboration because that air is now coming from somewhere and you don't know where that is, but it ain't right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I think, I think that's such a big deal. So before we dive into this deeper, because this is such a, this is a topic I think we can really go deep into <laughs> for sure. Why don't we say hi to a couple people? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? We have an audience. We have an audience. All right. All right. Let's start off with George Ryman, BS Friday. Can't wait. Good morning from Phoenix, Arizona. And George says, what is the cold thing you speak of? It was 102 <laughs> here yesterday. <laughs> It was. I was I was in Texas and it was 90. So I agree with you, man. There is something nice about that warm weather still. I, I lucked out in July. The week I was in Texas, Dave, it was 78 degrees. Wow. So I, I really lucked out. It was that it was that three day window. Yeah. I drove in and there was a rainbow, my a, a double full rainbow my first night. So Texas wow. welcome man. When I left, it was 102. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, Buzz Holitzer. Hey, Buzz. Happy BS Friday. Love it. Love it. And then our good uh, our good friend, Greg Ugaldi, who is the chairman of the National Association of Home Builders, immediate past chairman, I should say. Great job, Dave Cooper Live, bringing everyone together. That's what we do here. We have some fun. Yeah. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Eric Kaiser, dew point for the win. Hey, Eric. I love, love it, Eric. Eric. Great comment. All right, let's see. Who's Eric? Tell us who Eric is. Uh, Eric is very active um, on a Facebook uh, group that I'm part of that is um, by Brian Orr called HVAC School. And yeah. so many intelligent, smart HVAC techs on there that are really out there trying to fight the fight, the good fight and winning, wow. but coming up with very innovative ideas and sharing. It's, it's, it's a great, I learned so much on there. So, That's so great. Nick, you're saying folks that work in basements have to worry about humidity too. <laughs> and, and even better yet, crawl spaces. So yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, right. you know, uh, it surprises me that crawl space, that houses are still being built on crawl spaces, to be honest with you and vented crawl spaces in right. humid climates on top of that. Wait till you see more with the modular industry, right, Dave? It's 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 a common it's a common space. Yeah, there's 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 quite a bit of crawl spaces in in our industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, for for us, I mean, I can count the number of homes that I've actually ever built on a crawl space. But a lot of people across this country are building on crawl spaces with the modular because it's how you make your connection points. Yeah, right. and you're not going to go slab on grade. Yep. And they, you know, they leave them vented yep. and they think that air is going to come in one vent and just crawl, you know, cross that crawl space and go right out the other side. But, yep. you know, the reality of the warm air comes in, hits cool and goes up. 
So yep. um, a lot of challenges. I actually worked with a gentleman named uh, Jeremy Reitz. Uh, who owns uh, REITS Drying School. So it's a big yes. risk restoration school. And we put together a building science two-day crawl space class oh, based wow. on, you know, building science experts like Joe Steenbrook, Allison Bales. We work with Advanced Energy out of North Carolina. Um, and really it, it's about the building science because you – can't half-ass a crawl space. Either you completely encapsulate it and do it correctly, or you're going to cause more problems than what they're probably already dealing with if you do that. So you really need to understand the building science of changing the, you know, the envelope yeah. of that crawl space. I think, I think we're going to have a crawl space edition of <laughs> building science coming up, baby. Dirty. We've worked with a lot of builders who who have, again, it's, it's gotta be a pain point before we get the industry to change and accept another piece of equipment. And once they start having a lot of warranty calls because the wood floors are buckling um, or paints peeling or trims pulling away, stuff like that, that is, you know, when their warranty part department starts, uh, <laughs> That's, that's the quote of the day in the new T-shirt. <laughs> Jennifer, fire up the presses. We're making more T-shirts. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, for builders, there's a lot of warranty issues what comes with, you know, controlling humidity. And then, you know, worst case scenario, liability issues. And we're, you know, one of the places that we're seeing a lot of moisture issues in right now is multifamily buildings. Really? Cross-contamination? Yeah. Um, well, all the HVAC systems, except for a very small number, are way oversized for the for the space. And then we have to deal with ventilation by code. Right. And then we get, you know, potentially a lot of people in a smaller space. And so we, we need to have something that's in that space to control the moisture. Plus, how... I control my thermostat and how you control your thermostat yeah. are probably very different. So it might have been designed to, you know, and, and we get this a lot from architects. They're not living in the building the way I designed it. Nobody's going to. Right. And, 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 and is the unit commissioned and, and backing up on the front yeah. end, when you have a manual J and a manual D, that means you have to do the manual J and the manual D. Yep. It's it's not about hey, I could sell you this this brand new hoity toity piece of, you know. Yep. Uh, it's yep. dialing it in. It's, it's dialing it in and it dialing in how to use it and 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 how to change your air filters, people. <laughs> you have to do that? I didn't know you had to change your air filters. They don't change themselves. There's another one. Air filters don't change themselves. They don't. They don't. Well, listen. Let's 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 get it. Let's get to a couple more comments here, real All quick. Right. Um, so we actually had Brian was going to pop a comment in because I have I have a buddy of mine. He said I want to make my basement healthy. I want to, uh, you know, I want to I want to finish it, but he wants to do it in a way to where it's safe, it's healthy, and the longevity because he's been tuning into our show and learning a lot. Unfortunately, he's a private pilot, so he sent me a message. He's not going to be able to join, but he was able to get some uh, some comments over to us. So the first comment was, hi, Dave, great show. I have a question for Nikki concerning moisture solutions for a basement project I'll be starting in my home. I am still in the research stage of the project and was hoping to gain some insights into questions I should be asking potential contractors when it comes to combating moisture while promoting air quality in the finished space. So waterproofing is going to be huge. And uh, I guess first case, if there's any bulk water issues anywhere in that basement right now, those have to be addressed before you can do anything else. Um, a dehumidifier will not fix bulk water issues. So if uh, you're flooding at certain times with a lot of rain, you might need um, a French drain system or something like that. But get that addressed right away. From there... Anytime that you're putting, so basements are below the house and typically they'll run around um, 68 degrees, if not a little cooler. 
especially in the, the spring, summer, and fall, where we're air conditioning our house potentially and putting some cool air already in a cool space. So there's going to be not a lot of moisture control from our air conditioning in a cooler spot. Now, relative humidity is relative to, to temperature. So when we lower the temperature, the relative humidity automatically goes up. So for each degree we lower the temperature, the RH goes up a approximately 2%. So what we need to understand is we're going to have to have some dedicated moisture control down there, especially to stop any potential condensation on surfaces. And there is a big difference in buying a commercial grade dehumidifier and buying one from a big box uh, store. Um, Thermostores headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, our products are manufactured in Madison, Wisconsin, and we use commercial grade components. And the reason that's so important in cool spaces is because when you lower the temperature, um, the, the coils that is, is working to condense that can freeze very quickly. So I remember growing up, always having a dehumidifier in our basement in Wisconsin. And as soon as you would turn it like past the one dial, it'd be a solid block of ice. Yep. So you need something that is designed to actually remove water effectively and efficiently in cooler areas. And any materials you put down there, drywall, potentially carpet, a couch, a bar, whatever it is, um, it's going to be absorbing moisture constantly that's yeah. down there and there's going to be vapor pressure. So getting a good dehumidifier down there is, is very much key. Yeah. A lot of times we have those basements uh, that, that, you know, the, it starts out. I like the point that you brought up first manage bulk water and make sure that's taken care of because you can't use a dehumidifier if you still need a shop vac. Right. Yeah. So you have to stop that. But then a lot of times our mechanical systems are sized for the occupied spaces. And yeah. now you're introducing almost the square footage of your basement to that. So is that air sealed? Is your mechanical system capable of still heating and cooling that main space? And what are you doing for ventilation? Because not a lot of basements have windows or fresh air uh, included in them. So now that you want them to be people friendly, uh, there's steps you have to take. It's not just about what paint color and what, what tile am I putting in. Yeah. And what, what about the materials that you are using? You mentioned that. Do you actually put it, you put material right against the concrete wall? Do you have to have a vapor barrier between that concrete wall and whatever material you're putting in? So, because concrete typically, if it's a poor foundation, it's not going to be water tight. It's going to be water, you know, mm -hmm. where water moisture can always be in the wall. So how do you, how do you control that? Does the dehumidification control that? And if it does, how do you get air circulation behind the wall you put over it? Yeah, I think from what I've seen, there's usually some types of furring strips or uh, even studs if you potentially want to insulate, yeah. but you, you can't put drywall right on concrete, right? Because concrete's although you know water's supposed to run downhill except for when it doesn't right so we're going to get that capillary suction of moisture that's through right. that that concrete so um that's you need to make sure that you're working with professionals that know how to finish basements when it when it comes to that because there are horror stories of you know when you diy it at, at least be watching YouTube videos and going to the experts who are offering the building science of how to do it. If you're going to do it. There, there's a difference between people that walk around in t-shirts and shorts and like a cool basement and, you know, play pool or have the bar or whatever they do. And then there's the, there's other uses of the basement right. where you sit still and you watch a movie and you're not moving. So, so you have to plan your space accordingly to, to insulate and ventilate. We're seeing right now a lot of basements being turned into home gyms because during COVID gyms have been closed. So, yep. And so then you start sweating a lot. There's a lot of moisture. We don't have the ventilation we should have. Right. Um, also kids toy rooms, a lot of times are put in basements and we really need to understand um, 
the the respiratory and the immune systems of children and how they're growing and how our indoor air quality really can affect that. So really yeah. important. A lot of stuffed animals. I mean, it's just yeah. going to absorb moisture. So I, yeah. I, think, I think if we were to give Brian the best advice, it sounds to me like, you know, the contractor, whoever you use, they need to have a moisture mitigation plan that makes sense and that you can understand because that's really the big deal here is, all right, how are you controlling the moisture on my wall? If you are going to put something over my wall, how are you controlling that moisture? It all comes back to tell me how you mitigate the, the moisture or the water issue. And I think uh, if you can get a solid answer on that from somebody, they probably have some good idea on what they're doing. Absolutely. I would say in my entire life, I've never once put carpet in a single home I built or renovated. And the last place I would put it would be a basement. Don't do it. I grew I grew up in a house where our basement flooded twice a year. Yeah. And uh, no carpet, yeah. brother. Yeah. And so, I would, you know, the goal is we usually say keep it less than 60% relative humidity in the humid times. Um, when your HVAC contractor designs your HVAC system, and according to Manual J, it's 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity. So we need to understand where we're reading the relative humidity is in one spot. And as you get farther away from that, potentially it will, it could rise, you know, 10% above that. So yeah. I would keep my living spaces, I would keep at 50% with the understanding the farthest bedroom or, um, you know, if it's the basement, it, it probably is going to fluctuate a little bit higher, potentially lower in areas, but 50, I think is a good target. Love it. Love it. All right. Perfect, man. So Brian, I hope we answered your question today. We're going to take a couple more comments and we'll jump back in. So we got uh, Diep Tan joining us. Love how you refer to the tipping point as dripping point from YouTube. Thank you for joining us today. Always love it. We have Andrew Seely. Indoor weather can be complicated. Now, this is a cool cat right here. I was fortunate yep. enough to have dinner with Andrew in uh, Texas this past week, uh, which was so much fun. And I'm glad he uh, took the time to, to say hello to us. Uh, we got Adam White joining us, BS Fried, Boys and Girls. This is a guy that plays with goats, man. He's the coolest cat in town. Yeah, uh, yeah he lives. He lives in the UK, and his his goat Nick is uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Vincent Van Goat. Oh, Vincent right. Van Goat. I had two Nigerian uh, dwarf goats when I lived in Wisconsin. Loved them. Awesome. Love that. Love <laughs> that. Wow, Nikki, we got, we got a ton of comments in here. We're going to take a couple more, and then we got to hop back into where we're going so we can get to everybody. It's been 36 minutes already. Oh, my gosh. All right, here we go, here we go, here we go. We got Matthew Cooper, happy to join hey, you all. Good, good, good. Thanks for joining us, Matthew. I didn't know your cousin was on, Dave. That's wonderful. <laughs> hey, we may be related. Who knows, right? <laughs> clearly, clearly he's hanging with good company if Nikki knows him, so he must be uh, part of my genes. My genealogy. <laughs> All right, Eric. Eric Hi, yeah. Nikki. Okay. Greg, <laughs> Dave, please have Mark and Nikki explain how their concerns can be broken down geographically throughout the U.S. So that's a good question by yep. uh, Greg Ugaldi, the immediate past chairman. Yep. Um, green grass climates. So anywhere that you're getting about an inch of rain or more a week, uh, during the spring, summer, and fall, you probably will need some sort of dehumidification. So a lot of times when I say whole house dehumidifiers, people are like, oh, if you live in Florida, you must need one of those. And the reality is in the past and probably um, for, the, for a lot of the housing, housing stock in Florida, <clears throat> they're, they're running their air conditioning quite a bit. So they're getting more dehumidification throughout the day for a longer period of time. Some of the highest dew points that have ever been recorded are actually up north. And so we know Maine can have just as high a dew point as Florida does. It might be not be for a long as period, but we're also not running our air conditioning as much in order to be able to deal with that moisture that's in the air. Yeah. So really anywhere where if you've got green grass, um, you're going to need dehumidification at some point and potentially somewhere in your house. 
Yeah, for sure. So this is kind of hitting on a, on the next bullet point that we're going to jump into here, um, and that is how can you ensure the health and wellness of your building? And that's kind of what you kind of led into just right now in regards to if you have green grass, you're going to need dehumidification somewhere in your home at some point during the year to keep that moisture transfer from getting stuck somewhere and exactly. causing mold issues, right? And absolutely dehumidification in certain climate zones or green grass, everybody needs ventilation and everybody needs filtration throughout right. this entire country. Um, we need to be controlling the air in our homes, especially right now where we've got people homeschooling, working from home, a lot of people home 24 hours a day, generating a lot of moisture, contaminants. And so it really needs to be top of mind. And we need to have those air changes in our house to get the contaminants out and get fresh air in and filter it's, it. It's like you said before, Nikki, we're in our homes more, we're cooking more, we're cleaning more, uh, hopefully we're showering more, right? So yep. all these contributors. Yeah. So, well, I mean, there's cooking, but do, do bodies give off moisture? Human beings? A quarter a of a pint per person an hour. So a family of four. And so a pint's a pound the world around. So if we say a, a pint Pints or a pound, um, that's the same thing. So if I say I have a 70 pint dehumidifier, it's a 70 pound dehumidifier. But yeah, so four pints or pounds of water for a family of four per hour. So That's a new t-shirt, Jennifer. Pints oh. a pound of the world around. <laughs> <laughs> pint <laughs> per pound is the world around. I got it right here, Mark. Here it comes. A pint per pound is the world around. A pint's a pound. A pint's pint's a pound. A pound. Ah. A pound. Yep. Same thing. So, so the other thing we, we spoke about offline, Nikki, is this time of year, uh, we're getting ready to have more fires. And a lot of people put firewood in their houses. And uh, the, the, the wing nut uh, factory uh, from, from Peter Yost has deduced gallons, right? Gallons of water exist in our cords of wood that we introduced to our building. Gallons, not, not pints or pounds, gallons. Yeah. Of, of, of like cut wood for fireplaces, you mean? Yeah, your cords. Yeah. So then you think about how your house is made of wood and how much time you need for construction drying alone. So, you know, when, when new homes are being built and you're in a climate that gets a lot of uh, water, you know, rain, you really got to think about when you're closing up those buildings and how you're going to deal with that. Um, Cause yeah. there's going to be a lot of moisture in those buildings. And a lot of, you know, our, our, our restoration equipment is used on building sites to, to keep the projects moving plus to, pro to provide some construction drying as well. Absolutely. So, it's so imperative. The, so what does the moisture attract? Like, so the, the moisture, I mean, other than it grows mold, we know that. But I mean, it also attracts bugs, does it not? Yeah. Dust mites, um, off gassing, just like, yeah. you know, we love the smell of a new home, new car, as everybody says, but it's not good for you, but yeah. we all get in and sniff it. Well, <laughs> and, and termites and insects, right? I mean, there's, right. there's a lot of insects. We, we actually provide a lot of dehumidifiers to the pest industry, to pest professionals, because now there's you know, integrated pest management. We don't want to be spraying chemicals all the time in houses. So if we can control the moisture that attracts a lot of, and they reproduce and colonies are created, if we can mitigate that a little bit and, and minimize the, the amount of chemicals we're spraying in our homes, that's a huge plus. Yes. Yeah, so dust mites, um, what most people don't know is if you suffer from indoor allergies, uh, which about 80% of the people who suffer from indoor allergies are actually allergic to dust mites and not dust mites themselves, but the fecal matter of dust mites. So as soon as you lower the relative humidity in your house below 50%, they can't live. So below 50%. Yep. Yeah, so as soon as you do that and control the relative humidity, they die. So if you have uh, a multifamily uh, building right now, and you probably have had at least one issue with dust mites, right? 
uh, now here's your here's your answer. Yeah, yeah. dust mites are a huge uh, a huge issue. My daughter had asthma growing up, and um, so air cleaner, ventilation, and humidity control were were our saving grace for sure. Um, and then off gassing is a big one. Most people don't realize. So Chinese drywall. We've all heard of it. It was in Florida. It was a huge problem, caused our HVAC systems to corrode, huge indoor air quality problems. Well, the reality is, is that drywall made it farther north. We just don't know where it's at because it was the humidity that was causing it to off gash so rapidly and cause the issues. So uh, the more we can control the humidity, the slower our products will off gas and create indoor air quality problems. There was, uh, I know Florida, when they were looking at going to their ventilation um, requirements, their Mike, Michael Moore wrote a paper and basically said that if you do not require mechanical ventilation till you th hit three ACH 50, the amount of formaldehyde in these homes is good, and I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was like right. astronomical compared to if you were to ventilate these homes. So we know that builders consider ventilation, um, everybody, not even just builders. First of all, builders up front, it's the cost of the ventilation product. And then we all care about the energy use of that ventilation product. Um, which is really minute when we look at the benefits of indoor air quality. We don't use ventilation for our energy standpoint. We use it because people in the home need right. good, fresh air. Yeah, long before we get to energy, we have to be alive. We have to be healthy, yeah. right? Yeah. And, no, and, and, and no good deed goes unpunished, right? We make our buildings super energy efficient, and then we have indoor air quality products, and nobody wants to live in them. Right. So. I think Joe Steenbrook had the, I attended one of his sessions at a passive house conference and someone asked, um, so we're going to tighten up our homes and now you tell us we have to put in a dehumidifier. He's like 10 steps forward, one step back, and you cannot energy conserve your way to dry. And, and it's perfect. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Joe, Joe's the godfather of, of many of us, so uh, it, it is perfect. And speaking of your great quote there, no good deed comes unpunished. It goes back to your, your drywall comment when yeah. uh, the Make It Right Foundation uh, came in in New Orleans, right? They tried to do so much good with, with producing yeah. those housing. And the, the, the amount of lawsuits and, and health risks involved for the occupants uh, overshadowed the good of offering shelter and dwelling. That was a that was a, a, a strong case in point of what happened in our industry. It's still still dealing with it today in some of the lives of those folks. Yeah. So yeah. Our, our HVAC equipment is is becoming more energy efficient. Um, and as a byproduct of getting to that temperature on the wall and our, our tight envelopes, um, we just we, they don't remove as much water as they used to. Yeah, yep. for sure. All right, listen, everybody, if you are tuning in, which I know you are today, we got a ton of comments to get through. We got some great questions that are happening in the in the comments, and I think it's all pertinent, and we want to make sure we try and get to as many people as we can. So we're going to speed round this last round and, and try not to get too far in the weeds so we can get to all of you. Uh, but if you are, please hit that like and share button right now and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give them the like button, Mark. There you go. 2030 committed. So well, with that said, uh, if you're not following DaveCooper.live, please do. Mark Willie, uh, follow him. And if you're not following Nikki, well, you should. She knows a lot <laughs> of other players in this industry, and uh, clearly she knows what she's talking about. All right, let's get to some comments and start doing some speed round stuff here because we are at almost 50 minutes. All right. Curious to hear your thoughts on studies that are showing that optimal H RH ranges, relative humidity, can, be, can impede airborne viral transmission. So I think that's on, um, I don't know if you ever got that chart um, that I had sent over, but there is a relative humidity health chart. Um, I think it's called, it was through ASHRAE, and I think the gentleman's name was Sterling who developed it. 
but it shows that viruses uh, can be uh, mitigated or, or, or controlled more in our environments if you keep the relative humidity between 40 and 60. Um, and I know there's a huge initiative right now um, trying to really get that minimum threshold. So here's my concern when we throw out relative humidities. 40 would be in the winter time. If you can get to 40% and my house in Wisconsin was built in the 1870s. It had been remodeled. There was no way I was going to get to 40, no matter how much water I pumped in in the winter time in that house. Um, but a lot of times people think, well, 40 is good. 60 has got to be better. And if you try to get to 60% in a cold climate in the winter time, you are going to create a lot of moisture issues and you are going to grow mold. So we need to understand that these ranges and thresholds that are being thrown out um, are relative to times of the year and relative to a temperature. So I would stay below 60 in the human months. And if you can get to 40, um, I've never lived in a house in a northern climate that actually made it to 40, but I know tighter houses um, high performance homes in cold climates. Absolutely. They're trying to get rid of some of that moisture through ventilation. Beautiful. Perfect. All right. That was AJ. I looked, uh, I looked them up on the phone as uh, public profiles, not transfer into our system here. All right, AJ, thank you very much thank for you. that. All right. Moving, moving down the list here. We have Joe Madosh. Oh, what hey, is, Joe. What is your recommendation for a dew point in a residential home? Well, we talked a little bit about this. Nikki, as many of our friends as Rick Karg and others, and no one would answer this, they said, if it's bad idea. They say stick with RH. So ASHRAE recommends 55 degree dew point in the home. So we want to stay at a 55 degree dew point uh, in the humid munch in summer um, in the home. And that's, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's uh, documents and recommendations from ASHRAE on that out there. I'm pretty sure ASHRAE has a lot of documents. A lot of it. That's why I drink coffee so I, so I don't fall asleep reading my ASHRAE documents. <laughs> Oh, they're that good, are they? All right. <laughs> they're lengthy, Dave. Matthew uh, Cooper point two. <laughs> Matt Matthew Cooper says he was answering AJ. One hundred percent do changes how the droplets behave and how far they can go. I'm not sure I understand. One hundred percent. I wonder if that's in in reference to oh 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 yeah. He's talking about uh, the viruses and and Matthew has been right. very involved in with some hospitals here in the Northern Virginia D.C. area okay. about virus containment. So he, great resource. He knows a lot about it. Okay, Good. Matthew, get ready for a phone call from Dave and I. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're bringing you in, man. We're, we're going to do some genealogy tests first. All right, Eric Kaiser. So how does slab on grade construction affect internal humidity and wet climates if there's no vapor barrier installed during construction? That's a good question. Why is there no vapor barrier installed during construction? That's a good question too. Yeah. 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 So uh, Dave, can you leave the comment up on there so I could reread it? Uh, so slab, slab on grade. Uh, so slab on grade is really popular. We talked about this before the show. Um, look, you're saving you're saving uh, a lot of time and expenses doing slab on grade. So we know that insulation is cheap. So first and foremost, let's take the step and let's let's insulate around and below that slab. Right? That gives that gives everyone a fighting chance for better comfort. Uh, over and above, if there's contractors or concrete people that don't put uh, a heavy mill product down first, can you please explain to me why in the world of sports you would do that to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. That's my building science professional answer. There's, I mean, <laughs> concrete is is water. It's, and it's continually going to be releasing water. And even with the insulation, you've got to get that insulation to try to minimize this as much as possible, but it's still going to do it. Yeah. Amen. And don't put tile on it four weeks after you pour the slab because you want to wrap up your project. Good grief. Yeah. 
That'll be tough. Tell us how you feel, Mark. <laughs> ah, good, great. Hey, hey, Dave, I came here to drink some coffee and talk building science, and I'm almost out of coffee. Oh, no, we better get go. We better keep going. So I got some other comments here. Let's get to them real quick. And if I miss anybody or go over anybody, it's just I want to give everybody a chance here. Uh, Jamie Hager, I'm so excited. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> I'm so excited to see ventilation and dehumidification finally getting the deserved attention. Thank you for this, Nikki. Love She's it. Awesome. Uh, she, works, wrote. she works with Southern Energy uh, in uh, North Carolina. Great organization. Awesome. Well, nice to meet you, Jamie. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Maybe we'll have to have you on the show one of these days. <laughs> The um, bug angle. That's beautiful. I didn't even see that first part of the comment. Yeah. The bug angle. Well, yeah. This is new. This is a follow up to our first one. Best way besides mold to get a home buyer's attention to care about humidity. The bug yeah. Sell the attributes, your health and your functions inside of your building depend on those things. This yeah. is the utmost important. Uh, I'm so glad that she acknowledges what you're doing here, Nikki, because I think everyone else. We know this is a hot topic, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop back up here to Joe uh, again. Astra 62.1 commercial has shifted from relative humidity to dew point. It does not seem to be the case plus 62.2, which is residential. Do you have a recommendation for dew point in residential environment? 55. Yep, I would stay with 55. So. Um, We'll never forget yeah. it. like that. There's, there's a lot of things. Uh, we're very heavily involved, our organization, uh, with ASHRAE and <laughs> So, because um, our D, you know, and that's one thing, you know, so positive pressure ventilation in humid climates is very important. I know yeah. we talk a lot about balanced, that, you know, that sort of thing. But if you can get a slight positive pressure, to stop from the hot going to cold and wet going to dry and then negative. That is, that is so important. We want to try to achieve a uh, positive, but yeah, a 55 degree dew point is what I've been taught. And I can only listen to all the building experts that I uh, listen to. So it, 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 it's funny, Nikki. So you just said hot air goes to cold. It does, is that the way to say it, or is the way to say it warm air goes to cold? I know this sounds semantics, but you know we we dive into these uh, building science guys, and and I remember one time being attacked by a swarm of people saying, "Don't say hot hot air goes to cold, warm air goes to cold." I just it, it's an interesting thing. If it's the energy. Is that what they're going after, or yeah, I don't yeah. know. Sometimes I think they like to pick a BS fight. Oh, exactly. I mean, they're they're getting into uh, the thermodynamics laws, and they're ready to rumble. I guess. Yep. Yep. Anywho, that's neither here nor there. Neither. I just get a laugh. <laughs> no, I think that's actually good. Here, Mark, I got something for you, man. We we're even going to do it this way. So for folks that are just tuning in, Dave is live again at the at the at the modular which what's it called I'm at the MHBA, the Modular Home Builders Association annual meeting. Annual uh, meeting. It's so this is where uh, we all get together. It's one of the it's one of the first in person meetings that's been coming up. So it's been a lot of fun being here. And uh, you know what? It's just so nice. Even if you're not even if you're still six feet apart from everybody, just to socialize wow. outside of over the camera, which has been great. Um, but you know, all right, let's keep moving on this. But thank you for that plug. You can see I got the sign behind me. I don't know if it's covered up on your end, but the it's MHBA, up your face, Dave. The MHBA, man, they they you know what? These are people that fight for our rights. They fight for the codes. They are the ones out there protecting us when silly stuff comes across legislation for our industry. So fight for the right to build off site. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Hey, I, I saw this is a good follow-up from Joe. Real balance ventilation, not the single source exhaust on off fart fan. <laughs> well, yeah, Joe, I'm starting to like you, man. <laughs> He's a good I, guy. I, we got, oh, hey, guess, guess what, Mark? Maybe Brett can tell us where we can get those cool sunglasses. Oh, yeah. Make it, it, you're right about that, Brett. It, it was a black eye for green, but uh, a, a good eye for green. Yeah. Brett was on last week, Nikki. He's a good and, guy. Uh, I like Brett. Hi, yeah, Brett. Brett. Ever, if, if someone doesn't like Brett, then I don't like them. Um, <laughs> I'll just put it on the line. 
I, I, I'm pleased to announce, Dave, that on October 20th at 7.35 in the evening, I'll be speaking for Brett Little. We're at uh, virtually. So just tune in All to right. uh, the Net Zero Residential Conference at GreenHomeInstitute.com. That's right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, good, good, good. Make sure you put that out and we'll keep sharing it too. I know you already did some of that. All right. Jennifer said, so Nikki, for all the DIYers out there finishing their basements right now, what's the best finished floor option? Heard you all loud and clear that it's not carpet. I would make sure whatever you use, if it's going to be an engineered wood or tile or whatever it is, that it's actually designed to be put in a basement on top of concrete. Um, there's a lot of options out there, but you really got to be particular about what you put down before you put down the flooring or if it's already attached. There's a lot of different products. So um, I just think whatever the manufacturer says is probably what to follow. And, and, and if it's an existing home, it probably does not have insulation. And depending yeah. on your ceiling heights, there's a lot of applications where you can actually lay down insulation, run your boards, run your subfloor and actually put down Hardwood yeah. floors, the traditional way, uh, but not if you do not address your bulk water and your humidity. That's step one. Yeah. Love it. You know what? And to follow up on that, Brian Vincenti, we answered his question. Fantastic tips and suggestions. I took lots of notes. This is what it's all about. It's about educating, you know, not only the professionals in our industry, but also somebody like Brian, who is a consumer. So uh, glad, glad to have that question come in. Brian certainly understands water, right? He's got he's got two Suzuki uh, <laughs> outboards on there. It's beautiful. That he does. That he does. He flies jets for a living too. So he's a cool cat. Our kids play hockey together. Um, oh, that's Brian. Got it. Yeah. So better construction with Sean McStay. What is the most effective way to get homeowners to care about this? And then we're going to wrap it up with one more comment. So go for it. Who wants to take that one? That's you, Nikki. Uh, first of all. If, if the homeowner has a health issue, that needs to be addressed right away. So part of that comes if you're building for a homeowner, you know, ask questions about health and indoor air quality, because it might not be something they think of. Anybody have a asthma, allergies, respiratory issues? Um, then you need to get more into their home and what they want to protect. And comfort is a big one. And of course, property protection is, is always going to trump. So it's hard because the countertops and the light fixtures and all that are, are sexy. Um, and we don't think about our indoor air quality till 